everyone. Good morning and welcome to day two of Curiosity Brisbane's celebration of science, art and tech. My name is Benjamin Law and my official title here at Curiosities Brisbane is um, Master of Curious Conversations. So that's what, how I choose to be referred to from now on. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It's really great to be here with you on the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people. Uh, First Nations people on this continent have been sharing stories and knowledge here for tens of thousands of years. Um, combined, it's the oldest continuing human civilizations this planet has ever seen. Our first scientists, our first artists, and I'm especially grateful to elders past and present that we can continue discovering science, sharing stories, making art here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Now, today's session is called Virtual Time Machines for Cultural Storytelling. And today we're talking about how the most modern technology can be utilised to share the wisdom and culture of humanity's oldest human civilizations, And we've got two people to illuminate how that might be done. First, we've got Brett Levy, a First Nations digital Aboriginal and creative director and self-described virtual heritage Jedi, which is something that I really want to unpack with you in a moment, Brett. Um, he descends from the Kuma people, whose traditional country is bordered by St George in the east, Kunnamulla in the west, north by the town of Mitchell and south to the Queensland-New South Wales border. Now, for over three decades, is it now, Brett? You've been researching how to build a time machine to take people back to places across the continent before colonisation to the original sites of First Nations wisdom, guided by traditional owners, anthropologists, archaeologists, botanists and the interactive games industry. His work merges traditional knowledge with 3D virtual landscapes to present pre-colonisation Australia with all its Aboriginal culture, language, artefacts, community, trade, and more. Can you please make him welcome, Brett, everyone? Thank you. And alongside Brett, we've got uh, Professor Peter Anderson, a member of the Walpuri and Murrumpatha uh, First Nations in the Northern Territory. Um, previously Director of the Indigenous Research and Engagement Unit at QUT, Professor Anderson now leads the Kurumba Institute, which provides Indigenous research and education at QUT across disciplines. Can you please make Professor Peter Anderson welcome, everyone? <laughs> Now, this is going to be such an interesting deep dive into stories and knowledge and things that we can learn and how we can learn about it. But before we talk about the tech side of things, I want to know a little bit more about the education and the knowledge that you both grew up with um, when you were kids and teenagers in Australia, because I think education and knowledge about this continent and about our history changes depending on where you are, who you are, and uh, what era you grew up in. So maybe we'll start with you, uh, Peter. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how much, or even how little knowledge of Aboriginal uh, culture you had growing up? Um, I, I grew up in New South Wales on the Central Coast um, with my family from the Northern Territory. So we always knew uh, where we were from mm -hmm. and our stories in connection to Central Australia and Northwestern Australia. Um, but within the curriculum itself, it was actually quite... Uh, sparse, to say the least, um, you know, sort of Captain Cook came mm. you know, and saw people at Botany Bay, and that was really about it. So I went to school in the 80s and primary school and um, secondary school in the 90s, so it was really not much there at all. Um, and thinking which, about that now, you know, reflecting on it, how do you, how do you reflect on that? How, what, what did those kind of gaps in the curriculum do to you, your classmates, and to your generation? Well, I, I guess for me, um, what it did do is it sort of uh, homogenised us, mm -hmm. um, that we were all the same, um, we, there was only one culture, um, and it was, also, it was also written from a non-Indigenous perspective. Mm. So it was actually, you know, it was taught by, you know, white people who developed the curriculum. Um, and so I guess that's why I got into teaching in a roundabout way. Um, is that I can, could see a gap of representations of different voices um, in curriculum, but particularly how uh, non-Indigenous kids or non-Indigenous people are actually learning about us 
mm. um, from our own standpoints. Yeah. What about you, Brett? How similar or different was your experience growing up? I can remember in grade two um, learning about Cook Landing 2. Um, and then I was the only Aboriginal boy in a school at Infant Saviour on the Burley Heads where I was there. And then the class knew that I was an Aboriginal boy. And then I got name called yeah. all the time in the playground. I never thought about that till just then. Um, and then I, but I didn't bother me because I used to be a real, little bit of a quick runner. So I remember we used to sit back at, and eat lunch. The nuns used to make us eat lunch. I went to a Catholic school. And then once you finished lunch, we could get to the oval where we could play a game. And we had to try to bag the oval. So I used to get up over my after lunch and then sprint because I was fast, mm. bag the oval. And that's how I combated racism. Um, from that story of Cook, you know, that sort of classical shot of the black fella with his foot on his knee with a spear. And so whenever the kids used to call me names, and the girls defended me, women defended me, which is very important. That, that was that story back then. Mm. Now, apart from that, that's all there was. Um, and, uh, and from that day on, you just thought, well, how do we embrace that? But I'll tell you another story which relates to my great-grandmother in Maori. And she was a very, very knowledgeable woman with many, many languages. She used to speak a whole lot. And the ABC recorded her language when she was living at Cronulla in Sydney. And uh, that, that got kept there. And I remember when we want to go back and find that, those words, we go back there and that was held. It wasn't ABC at the time, it was something else. Uh, the broadcasting services. We, we're talking about the early 60s. And that knowledge came back there. And so Nana used to speak to me in language, and I never knew what she said at all, never got any words at all, but just the stories were to scare me to make sure I, I stayed in bed at night. Now, <laughs> there's stuff under the bed. Weren't you, didn't you guys say stories about things under the bed? <laughs> They were little hairy men. <laughs> now, you know about the hairy men story. You know, this is traditional knowledge passed on from generation to generation, right? I'll leave it there because there's more to be added. It sounds like when I hear both of you speak that there was this absence of Aboriginal education in the curriculum, within the formal structures of school, but that people around you were the key, that family um, ties and, and certain figures were, were the keys to unlocking that Aboriginal knowledge. Were there other steps along the way as well as you went along outside of the school system? What were the important sort of stepping stones in learning more? Um, I think for me, there wasn't anything really formal. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, I guess, uh, going to university and meeting other Indigenous people. Um, on campus and, and, you know, getting to know them, across, you know, as, in a, as a student body. But there wasn't a, a formal kind of thing there mm -hmm. as such. Um, and it, traditional knowledge is sort of in and of yourself and people and place. So our knowledge is located um, in a specific area. So mm -hmm. my father's knowledge is from Central Australia in a specific area in the Tanami Desert. And that's the only place I could have um, authority to speak from a cultural standpoint. Mm. So I thought that's, a, that's an interesting um, juxtaposition against what you learn at school and the sort of um, nuances mm. of how this plays out um, within our communities. Mm. What about you, Brett? Outside of the school system, what was important for you? I was thinking um, of visiting different people. So my mum used to know that I liked to learn things. Mm -hmm. I might sound like I talk a lot now, but back then I used to just listen. I listened all the way up to when I was 18, said nothing. Um, but what mum used to do was take me down and meet really important people on the Gold Coast. So we used to go, so what I call that was, we used to always move in community, all right? Now, now let me unpack that a bit. It's not sort of like a big group, but we used to go to a community around Tweed and there was a woman there who knew quite a bit about the Tweed. There was another community at Byron Bay that knew a lot about Byron Bay. There was another community in Moorwollumba. And they sort of got together, but they were separate as well. 
And in those spaces, there was an important person that mum would get to for me to see that I'd go and talk to and hear such a lot of stories about that space. Mm. And that was back when I was like eight, nine and ten. Then in school, I used to write stories in English about connection to country, and I never knew I was doing that, but I used to write stories about a legend about the, the whale at Talabudra. You know how the whale shapes that? You seen the whale there? Yeah. You all knew it was a whale, eh? <laughs> yeah. So that, that story, I would look at the forms, and then once you do that little form, then you, then you start looking at the landscape a whole other way. That wasn't in school. I took that out of community into school. And I think that maybe our little efforts like that maybe shaped what I call the embedding of Indigenous perspectives in the curriculum. Mm. And there's a big question. Brett, we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk soon about this really interesting and wonderful dynamic marriage of tech and Aboriginal knowledge that you've created through Maywa AR. But before we do, what's the origin story? Tell me about like, the phase in your life where you started getting into tech and what the appeal was. Can anybody remember Merlin? The little device called Merlin? What is Merlin? You know Merlin? It's a, you remember it? About 76? 1976? Yeah, it had like, it got re-released as well when I was a kid. Was it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, I'm, I would have had it a bit earlier than you. <laughs> Merlin was this thing where you had to remember sequences, number sequences, and it used to be a little button, beep, 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 right? Anyway, I pulled it apart. I couldn't put it together again. <laughs> All right, but that's technology. So, now, what... Why is mentioning that little dot, dot, dot thing? You know about Aboriginal dot art? Mm. That's how I would tie it together. So I remember we, were, we had dot art in our house and then I had that Merlin thing to play with technology. Now, can you see the machinations of a young boy putting together and, of course, how do you then bring that into technology? And that's where, you, that's where the marriage came there. Now... That's where it all comes. Were you already think? I mean, like, that's a beautiful visual connection you just made between, like, Merlin and the dots and traditional Aboriginal mm. art. Were you already thinking about that at the time or that's something that you um, came up with later on, that connection? No, it sort of came up later on. I mean, before that, I used to not want to do English and read. So instead I used to make mazes. Mazes where you're trying to get through the landscape and where you get attacked by snakes, um, red kangaroos, emus, mm. because out where, where our country is, the Goulburi and, and, the, and those red kangaroos can get quite cranky. You've seen kangaroos attack people? <laughs> yeah. Um, generally the bucks, I think. Was it the bucks mostly? I don't know. Was it the bucks or the women? We've probably all seen those photos of those incredibly shredded male kangaroos looking like they can beat the crap out of you, right? Yeah. yeah. They're, not, they're not always cute. No. They no. can be terrifying. Yeah. That's why our people in our country can run fast. <laughs> so, Brett, what, what comes first? What comes first for you? When it comes to something like Maywa AR, we're seeing something that we can use, point our phones, look around us and see, see very vividly and clearly what Brisbane, what uh, Maywa looked like pre-colonisation. But what came first for you? Was it the mission statement that you wanted to that you wanted to educate more people about what this continent was prior to colonisation? Or was it like, let's see what tech can do? What, what was the driving force? Listen, that's really complex and so many things. Um, it would be... Um, one time, my, my, one of my uncles um, went down to, the t to Canberra to set up a, an umbrella up in front of Parliament House called Michael Anderson. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of him. He did a thing called the Ten Embassy. And um, he stopped at our house because my dad was a butcher. And that meant we had meat in our house in that year, um, which is pretty, you know, that's pretty big, having meat. You know how expensive steak was. So we had that. So at that point, that influence of knowing that he was getting, doing that, the fact that we're trying to make a statement about our connection to country, mm. the fact that we have a sovereign right, um, a, a, you know, a lesser extent native title right, and that there is perception and, a, and a, a persistence and a continuation of our people. How do we make that happen? And then, and then also make it fun. Mm. You know. So the thing is that um, you know you 
earlier you said something about the Jedi. <laughs> We've got some serious issues in this country to deal with, mm. and, and you sort of you got to do it with a with a laugh. Mm. And um, and I've got to learn, I think, to not have a furrowed brow when the big questions come at me. Mm. You know what, what happens. I mean, Peter, when I hear that, you know, there's a lot of work to do and we've got to engage people and, if possible, make it fun, make it dynamic, make it relatable. You've, you've worked and wrestled with these questions for many, many years with the educational space, how to bake Indigenous knowledge within all the disciplines and also make people want to learn about the cultures um, that have been on this continent for tens of thousands of years. In your experience, generally, what works and what doesn't when it comes to inviting people to engage with that knowledge? Um, I think the very basic premise of what education is is something that um, I've wrestled with. It's a, education is something that's always done to somebody. Hmm. You're, you know, like you were taught this, you were, you know. And particularly within um, Indigenous content, if people don't want to do it and you're telling them to do this, the walls go up and you stop learning. So what I, I really strive to do is to actually make it very student-centred or learner-centred, mm -hmm. um, to, to make people want to engage in these um, different ways or different knowledge systems or pools um, that then changes their perspective um, on you know, our country, on our society, and how they engage um, just broadly. You know, sometimes I just say, I'll just be normal. <laughs> and it's like, what does that mean? Um, so I think it's actually repositioning and how we're actually engaging with and making it very student learner centred hmm. is most important. It's a, it's a timely conversation to have for Curiosity Brisbane as well because one of the big centre points for Curiosity is uh, the idea of STEAM, right? It's not, it's science, technology, it's, it's uh, all of those things, but we're also putting art in the centre and seeing how these things marry. When it comes to your work, because it's kind of looking at ways to ensure that Indigenous knowledge and education is across the disciplines... There's, there's obviously um, a priority to make sure that Indigenous education is a standalone bank of knowledge as well. But I imagine there's a priority to make sure that Indigenous knowledge is baked across the field. Are we getting that balance right? Are we getting that, that mission right? Look, I, I think we're getting there, there slowly, but I, th there's another nuance in here as well, mm -hmm. is that knowledge actually lays within people and place. And so we don't have a lot of Indigenous knowledge, well, i.e. academics mm. as such. Um, so we would have no Turrbal or Yagra academics at QUT who actually have authority for us to use their knowledge. Mm. So another way I, I try to engage with that is to talk about perspectives. How do we get Indigenous perspectives throughout the curriculum, across the curriculum, mm. that is linked to a discipline-based Western knowledge system. Mm. So rather than sort of just plonking it on, yeah. you know, we'll do a bolt on over here or week six, we're going to do something, yeah. you know, um, or we'll bring somebody in. Um, and it's really how do we also get non-Indigenous academics to engage in that space confidently mm. because they don't want to do it for fear of actually doing the wrong thing. Mm. So there's a whole lot of, you know, sort of unpacking um, fear and resistance before you can actually get to the, you know, doing things, mm. but it's, you know, it's getting there slowly. Yeah. I mean, when I hear Indigenous perspective, I think this project that we're talking about today, Maybar AR, does that in such a compelling way. Um, but maybe the best way to kind of showcase it is to actually showcase it. Can we perhaps yeah. see what Maybar AR looks like or the work that you're doing yeah. within this space looks I can, like? I can, I can show some stuff, but I want to say one more thing about what mm. Peter was saying. And I think Peter said it in some of our meetings is that um, he wants to make lifelong learners too. Um, that's also part of it that, you know, and that's also where you get people who just want to know more and be, gee, I think it's curiosity. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it like that. I didn't mean to go like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good branding. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. But it just seems like that, that lifelong learning stuff. But I just want to show you um, two videos, I think. Um, One's from someone who I really love, and he would have been there last night, called Shannon Rusker. And I've known him for so long, so long, and uh, we've been crossing paths. Let me just show it, and then and you'll see it's a story. Further west of the river. Quandamooka people! Bunker! He's 
acting out particular scenes that our messenger men used to do via the sending the smoke signals off the highest points around in the mountains and ridges and, and different areas throughout Brisbane. Then the next tribe um, would, would send their signals and their signals and all the tribes will come in and on the 4th of September we'll have a good corroboree. We're doing it exactly how uh, my grandfather Wolfram, he was a messenger man, the last one known of the tribe. He would carry the message sticks to different countries and um, that it was the host of the, the ceremony that would actually uh, smoke the area and make sure that it was, it was uh, clean um, and ready to go for the mobs. It was their responsibility. So, there's a lot of history that still remains around Brisbane, even though the buildings are up and um, even though we're settled in some places, we hold it all here in our heart. I just, I just showed you that video because um, when we do the work in meeting with people and talking with people, rather than just have this yarn, I do a video with them. And I've done, with that, I think I've done, I don't know, 300 of these? Just small one-minute vignettes about some connection to country. And I try to give it some high production values and, then, and I give it back to Shannon and say, there you go. And then say, can I use it? And that, that's how I've been doing that right the way through, you know, I've done a lot of these in Melbourne and Perth and, and whatnot, so there's lots there. These aren't seen. You, what you're seeing there is, like, not really shown anywhere. So, but that's, in a sense, something that I did for him, that he tells a story that, you know, if his kids want to reflect, that's how they can see that down the track. Yeah. So there's lots in this, there's lots of unpack on this one, but I'll just do one other, um, which I'll just find. But also what a privilege for us, especially those of us who are Queenslanders, um, to hear those words, um, those names that we should all know if we're in this region, in this state, Kwandamooka, uh, Gubby Gubby, that, that's um, the land in which I grew up, for instance. Um, and that emerging kind of knowledge that we're all, I think, hungry for as well. Um, that call that just came through was from Alistair Lyle. And um, he was the coordinator for Australia Day Live. So he's ringing me on a Saturday. He might be watching it. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's probably saying to me, hey, show the Australia Day Live. Does anybody see Australia Day Live on ABC? You see that? Yeah. So that was the guy that was the coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, he was a... Um, he really... They really tried hard to embed Indigenous perspectives, which I think relates to what we're talking about today. Mm. So... So, Tell us about the second video that we're going um, to see, Brett. Yeah, this is, this is another one. so much for sharing those, Brett. Let's talk about Mewa AR, which is one of the curiosities here at Curiosity Brisbane. Uh, this is an AR experience where you can use your phone to access 
visually and through sound as well, what the site looked like in 360 degrees around you before there was colonisation. Um, how does it work? Lead us through it. Um, well, it's just, uh, if you look about and you see all the stations that are in the Curiosity mix within the map, you can go to a site and you'll see a little QR code, flash your phone up, your phone camera, and it will trigger a, a 360 degree video that you can navigate through and see that particular action at that location. Um, now, there's a lot of research that goes in with that. A lot of um, time, effort, getting it right, consultation to make those stories as true as we can uh, make. And, and at the locations that we're doing, we're actually, you are at that site where you are, within 50 metres, mm. and sometimes exactly. So, you know, it's just the way that the paths are. So those stories are renditions of the land. They're, they're celebrating that connection. They are, uh, there's lots of parts in it. And in that way, um, you're seeing, you're seeing a connection to country, a particular action, um, it could be sustaining, and it, it could be ceremony, it could be law. Mm -hmm. And in effect, it's, I think, in that way, when we go back to first settlement, what we're saying, or before first settlement, what we're saying is the way that we would manage our community today in terms of council, in terms of the law courts, in, in terms of our roads, in terms of our cultural spaces, it's not dissimilar to the communities that we had as they were in Brisbane. Mm. And then you can mirror that in all the different capital cities and regional towns. That's what this, this means. So when you're there and you're having a look, think about today when you go back in the past. And um, that's really the, the, the message that comes out of that. You talked about research. I'd love to know more about the conversations um, that went into the process of making this because we talked about before how work involved uh, working alongside traditional owners, anthropologists, archaeologists, botanists and then of course the interactive games industry itself. What were the, what were the interesting conversations along the way in the development of this? Um, there was one about a few days ago at the Naya stuff where they're talking about the indigenous voice. Mm. So the indigenous voice um, was just happening as cruising around the country and that's headed up by Mick Gooder. If you heard of Mick Gooder, he was a commissioner. And um, Mick rang me and said, can you come to the Elders Forum, which I thought, I'm not that old. <laughs> 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 but um, it was good to go and in there, it gives you strength because you, you're at that point and then people are saying, oh, Brett, what, I'm watching what you're doing and that gives you a strength. That that knowledge and that feedback. And then what happens when they say, we well, love what you're doing, but. <laughs> you get this big but and then you take that in there. So you're constantly hearing this, that and the other on particular things that you might post. So you show a bit and get feedback. And mm. it, it, it's like a iterative process of slow growth, development, advancement, authenticity as well as connection, and that comes from those type of forums. Now, when I mention that forum, that is one of thousands. Um, previous to that, there was the Australia Day walk from just up here, or no, sorry, Roma Street Parklands, wasn't it? Over to Musgrave Park, and in there, you... No, we started actually down at, um, outside the casino, actually. Mm. And then we walked across, and so in there you've got all those people saying, oh, in that community, because that's what that particular moment is, people talking about their agendas, and then they say, oh, Brett, you're doing this, and so they give you a bit more as well. That was one significant conversation there was with a guy called Alex Bond, if you heard of Alex Bond. Alex Bond works at UQ with um, Dr Paul Mehmet, who does a lot of Aboriginal architecture. And so Alex has got some ideas about stuff and, and he knows a lot about the Garani. That's Alex's sister is there. And by the way, they don't talk. <laughs> so I was a bridge there for them too. That's an exclusive just for, <laughs> just for this session, is that yeah, right? But, but, hey. but I, I say that though. I say that because 
you, you re must realise that Indigenous people have got lots of different ideas. They sometimes come together and sometimes they don't. Hmm. And you would have obviously witnessed this at some time and seen it. So we're all trying to get to the same spot, but the way mm. we do it might be different. What do you think? So, so we're currently on the lands of the Turubu and Yagara, uh, Turubu and Yagara. When you look at a map of this continent, there are more First Nations on this continent than there, are, than there are in modern Europe. So if you had this experience on any other First Nation, you're going to see different things. What, about, what is it about this particular region, this land, that is special, Maywa, this land that we now know as Brisbane, when we use the Maywa AR experience and, and look at what, what culture was around here before colonisation, what strikes you as particularly special about this particular place and, and its people? What I think is so important about Maywa is that it tends to be a meeting place of many tribes. Hmm. So when you think about the history, history of what Petrie wrote about where they came together up towards Petrie Terrace Way, hence why it's named Petrie Terrace, there's many groups that would be there. When you think about the Roma Street parklands and the ceremonies that would have went there and the camps that would have been there, there's something in that. When you think about um, the river crossing that you find people celebrate, there's a story within that. Why would you cross a river? There's a question. Why would groups come together and then camp at a spot? Where would they camp in relation to each other? Mm. You can that relate to your country too. Mm. Um, so there, there's that social order, and we're trying to build that back to say when, in respecting the country, we don't want to do we will, we'll do this technology this way and be mindful. This is an iteration in time of what it can be. Don't Watch where it's going to go. Hmm. Um, this, is, this is the best respect we can, showcasing what it's like so we can all, um, as we know, grow in tolerance and understanding to all the issues that we're dealing with with, with community and getting on and, and, and growing and advancing and, yeah. Hmm. And I suppose being sustainable and happy as well. Hmm. That's what it, I think is part of it. Peter, when people go out there and they're using Maywa AR and seeing what this land looked like, probably for the first time in a very new light, uh, what do you want them to be thinking about? What do you want them to be feeling? Well, I, I think it's um, to actually get a feeling that this, you know, the land is living and that we have been here a long time, hmm. you know, a time immemorial, and you can actually sort of have that experience through the app and actually see it. Um, and have that connection because it's a different medium than actually, you know, from a textual sort of basis where you might read about it in a journal or a book, etc. So it's a different way of actually engaging and having a deeper appreciation, mm -hmm. I think. And to what extent is it also about breaking down assumptions and misconceptions? Yeah, I think it also is um, really important in breaking down those assumptions. As Brett said, you know, we did have social order, we did have, you know, things we had to do, we did, you know, there, there were rules and things like that. So it wasn't just, you know, we were waiting, you know, for Cook to come across and, you know, set us all straight. You know, we were quite happy for a couple of thousand years, you know. <laughs> we were just hanging around waiting for you, you know. <laughs> so, and it's a different way of thinking. You know, and we still do that in our own families, just, you know, how we engage and how we engage with other Aboriginal people. Um, Brett, over the next uh, 16 days now, I think it is, you're going to, I imagine, see a lot of people react to Maywa AR um, as, they're, as they're using it. But in the, even in the development stages of making Maywa AR a reality, what have been some of the reactions from people that have stayed with you? Oh, it's, uh, it's fairly humbling and overwhelming uh, in many times. So that's one part of it. Um, um, so that's, that's important. And, of course, it opens up a whole conversation. I think I said it last night at the, at the launch when I was showing the Brisbane greeters. Um, very important, I suppose, glue in our, in our city to bring newcomers an understanding of our city and then to give them some more ammunition in that was really rewarding. So... Uh, the Brisbane greeters, you've seen the ladies around in there? Yeah, they're wonderful, wonderful. And then 
What I'd say that to that is that when you trigger this, I think it's called mnemonic, is it? That's a good word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might learn how to spell that one. <laughs> but um, that stuff meant that they gave me a bit of their past and their connection to First Nations people, and it opens up a conversation. Mm. So that's the key. That the, so when you do this stuff, it's good that it's there and they can see it on the app, but then it's better to be about when, it, when you're seeing it, and then that, that's what we want to do. We want to talk. We want to talk with you in a second too, please. Mm. Um, that's the key. Um, so yeah. So you so use the app and use it with people as well. Start having those conversations. Start having those conversations with people around. Look, I, when I when I've used the app, Brett, it's such a seamless kind of experience. But we all know that things that seem effortless usually take a lot of effort. Um, can you guide us through uh, what kind of tech was involved and invested into making Maywa can I, can AR, I talk tech? AR work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love tech. Brace yourselves, everyone. <laughs> No, no, I can go really good on this. Um, because um, how, do you, how do you make, through your phone, a 360-degree image of what pre-colonised Australia looks like? like what, is it camera imaging? What's going on? When, uh, can I say something? When Teresa first came to me, I had no idea. I had no idea at the very start. Mm -hmm. and, and so she said, can you do this? I said, I, I think so. And then, and, and listen, with all due respect, she backed me. And I said, right, okay. And then when someone gives you that confidence, you can do anything. And so, whooshka, away we went. The technology is um, three false starts in it, all right? You try something, didn't work, you go back. And I think there's something like in the code, uh, 50, 60,000 lines of code for one API, and there's about 17 APIs. How's that sound? Can I ask a dumb question? Mm. What's an API? It's a uh, application processing. In, 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 who's a technology follower here? <laughs> the API. one who knew Merlin. It's just like, <laughs> um, let me say like this, it's like a, an API could be like um, a browser. Okay, and then you build, and then the browser builds a website, and then it gives you, then an API might be the parts to w Word, and all those things come together to let you use the app as you need to. So. Rather than try to build it all the way down, you break it up into little bite-sized chunks and then you go, hey, can you do this API, you do this API, and I've got 17 guys that do all this stuff. Hmm. I'm starting to speak really fast. <laughs> so so that's, that's an insight into the tech. What about the art? Because it's been visually created in such convincing mm. detail, and it's quite fine detail um, that we're seeing there. How did that come to life? Um, the movement is motion captured. So we took uh, mm. the best skills of um, Hollywood and then put, um, I said last night, blood in the digital. Um, so we want people's movement so that becomes authentic. I think that's respectful. Mm. Um, and then the other part of it is the stories. The stories are taken from many yarns and different parts. And then we make those yarns into a spreadsheet and then draw it. So it, if you actually see the app, it just goes like that. It's fast. Like less than a second. And tell us about how you geolocate people within the site itself, because if you're near the river, you're going to see the river. If you see a particular part of the land, you see the land on your phone as it was. How does that work? What's going on? It's online, so you, it's geocaching. It's coming out of the satellite. Um, it's through our nice friends at NBN. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, the truth is that um, if it wasn't for the internet and that mm. stuff, it we wouldn't be inspired to be communicating in this way. And, and it, all our communities are connected now. We're doing so well that way. And, and, and on that front, we're all battling to work out a, an app that we can use in our communities to get them to work harder. And I might mention, even though we're in COVID now, we've all learned to work digitally and, 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 and come together in another type of community, an online community, as where we, where we can. And so there's, I think there's something in that for, for our, you know, our remote and regional communities to some extent, if we can we tap into that hmm. and teach them how. Hmm. That's where this fella comes in. <laughs> well, Peter, when you look at Maywa AR, um, we've, I think we've established why we need it. But is there a timeliness to it 
now as well. I mean, marrying these two things, ultra-modern technology to, to show the knowledge and the culture of the most ancient and ongoing civilizations that this planet has ever seen. Why is it so important that we have this now in 2021? Um, I think it's actually also keeping up with uh, how people are learning. Um, you know, there's this growing, you know, tags around being digital natives and, you know, people will engage with certain forms of knowledge in different ways. Um, and, you know, there's a, a growing area in education around digital pedagogies mm. and how you can actually get somebody to engage in something from a remote location like Zoom and still make, you know, content really interesting mm. and informative. Um, and particularly, I think, in the Indigenous space, it's actually about transformative. How do we actually transform people's minds and their practices and relationship to Indigenous Australia? You know, so mm. Also, how lucky that this has come out in an era where we all know how to scan QR codes now as well. Yes, yeah, that's halfway there. <laughs> Brett, what's next for this technology? Because Maywa AR is about a specific site, about a specific First Nations group of people. But as we said before, there are many, many First Nations and many, many landscapes across this continent. Do you see this travelling further? Yeah, well, we've got... Um, this is one project of, I think, 37 we're doing at the moment. Um, one of the ones that I'm really passionate about is these... I think I mentioned it, the Bar Calder women I'm working with out west. Um, they're looking to activate their community and, and tell some, um, I suppose, dream time yarns about the sun and the moon and the stars. So that's an important one. Um, and um, I'm going to go out there in April and meet with them and, and have a talk. Another one I'm dealing with is with, with Gadarjal. And they're looking at the land and sea management program and how we can map um, the indigenous values in the reef and then how... and at the moment I'm grappling with how to procedurally generate the reef growth over time, which mm. is sort of fun, and I've got a way of doing it. Um, if anybody knows how to, wants to be part, that come along and play along. But in that regard, um, there's, there's, little, there's things going on in, in our, in our, along our coastline where we're talking about managing the reef, where they really should be talking with First Nations people in terms of that management. Um, right from the top to the bottom, through Torres Strait right down to the um, to Gladstone, um, you know, there's some really big things going on in terms of trade with China, and they're destroying uh, seagrass for dugong. Um, you know, so how do you bring that back? And then how how can we take this technology, fun as it is, into that mapping of that seagrass in that location for dugong? And, um, and, 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 and there's a whole GIS arrangement around that, which is so important. And it's what you call participatory GIS. That's where the community come in and be mm. part of that. So when you see the stuff we do, it's, um, you're seeing a window uh, through one camera lens. So when you look at the work we do, we're actually building a digital reconstruction of Australia and all the cultural knowledge within it over both space and time. Mm. So one, one third one we're looking, trying to explore is how can we visit one moment in a geology, genealogy of our ancestors. So think about the different branches. Two grandparents, all right? Then there's, after that, there's what? Uh, two, four, eight, is it? Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. Mm. Think about that path you're travelling down in space and time to that moment of that person and what would be a day in the life of that person at that moment. Hmm. Now, that person could be holding a longbow in the Battle of Agincourt in France and getting up in the morning and debating how many arrows to take to that battle against the French, the French prince. How's that for experience? Would you like to be there? <laughs> this is where this is going. Mm. Make no doubt about it. We will be able to go to any space and place and time very shortly. It's so exciting to meet you at this juncture and at this point. I can't wait till I get my virtual headset on and you take me to ancient southern China. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm going to open it up to the audience, uh, our audience now for questions. If you raise your hand, speak up. I'll repeat questions so everyone can hear it. Yes, one here. Is it, it yeah? On my phone. I just it, love to see what it looks like. Yeah. Is it possible to get a visual on Maywa yeah, AR? Yeah. Yeah. I've actually, this is not launched. I'm going to show you something that's not actually launched. Yeah, All right? No, I mean like a thing. <laughs> um, this is a website we just, I don't think, have I shown you this yet? Yeah. This is a website so you can zoom in. I think I can pick. I think I've gone up the coast, haven't I? Coming in, into the city here. There's Brisbane. So there's the um, all the sites we've mapped historically. So For those of you who can't read the letters, because they're quite small, we've got things like possum hunt, bush medicine, borer. Mm. Um, what ha what happens on? So this is a map of of sites. Mm. Dance, right? A QR code comes up. What would happen if we scan the QR code, Brett? Then that would bring up that'll bring up the dance right. in an app. So after this, if you want to see, I've got a laptop and I've got a an iPad and a couple of iPads, and I can show you that in that. So this is just something that I thought I could use a digital screen to generate a digital screen, screen mm. and screen. So, so Brett, just to clarify, if it, will you have time after this event where yep. you can show people the yep. technology yep. on screens? Fantastic. Yep. Great. Thank you so much for your question. Did that work for you? Mm. From there? Uh, a question at the back. So earlier on, Brett, you said that you got digital native blood in the work. Can you just unpack that for the audience? Digital native blood yeah. in the work. What does that mean? So what we did is that we did a motion capture of the dancers. When you see the dancers performing, they're actually motion captured dancers from the Turrbal and Jagra people. And we had three days of motion capture at QUT. And in that, they dance different dances separately. Then we put them all together in the, as dancers. So some of those are Shannon's um, sons, mm. and some are Turrbal dancers. Some were uh, um, Sandy's from the Sandy's as well. So they all did the performances. And then if you see the dance, when you see the crobbery, um, and I'm encourage you to go to the site to do it. And then you'll see those performances there. And there's two different types of dancers. Um, we also did um, women dancers too, so we didn't just do just the boys, so we made sure we did gender across both. So, and all the animated movements are actually motion captured movements, so we actually use them in that work to do performance as well, like um, there's grinding, there was weaving, there was spear throwing, so it's all that type of work. Um, and furthermore, um, the artefacts that you see in there were actually artefacts modelled in 3D from the Queensland Museum. So we put those back in there. So whatever you see being used has actually got veracity and um, pr provenance from this local area. Mm. Um, if you didn't know, you know the government house up here? Did you remember when it used to have all those Aboriginal artefacts in it? No. Yeah, it used to have a lot of shields, a lot of boomerangs and whatnot. So. All those shields and things, we actually went in there, I think, a decade ago mm. and modelled them in 3D and, you'll, and they're actually in our database. Um, I think they've gone to the Queensland Museum. In effect, anything that our people have created physically is, is seriously and authentically authored into work as best we can make it and then placed in the context of the country it belongs. And that comes back to an important protocol in this type of work. Hmm. More questions from the audience? Yes, one here. In the question in terms of education, um, yourself as a, say, 18 year old and the absence of Indigenous history and knowledge in the curriculum, and comparing that to an average 8 to 10 year old at school yeah. now, how obviously there is still remarkable gaps that need to be addressed. How far down the journey of so I'll just repeat that back. So when you were a kid growing up, compared to kids growing up now of the same age, uh, where have, uh, how far have we come and how far have we got to go in getting it to where you think the ideal point should be in Aboriginal knowledge and education? Um, 
I think we're sort of at, at a tipping point almost. Um, every child in Australia has had some content, you know, from primary school through to high school because it's in the national curriculum. Teachers must be able to do it. But how they, do, if they do it well or not, is the next question. So as I say, you know, someone going through primary school may have the same lesson five different times every year. Because it could just be some, you know, teachers aren't talking to each other, that, you know, I'm doing this, next year you might do this, and there's not a scaffolded approach to knowledge. And so then they get to, say, doing a nursing degree or a teaching degree where you have to do an Indigenous depth unit, the resistance that you get from those mm. students is palpable. Because um, like, you're making me do this and you're making me pay for this and it's being taught rubbish, you know. Like, so I think like, this Can you unpack there. that a bit? Like resistance, mm. where's that resistance coming from, do you think? What are the sources of it? The, well, I think it's um, a bit of fit content fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, they've just been taught this content in such, uh, I would say, an unpassionate sort of way that it's just really terrible. Um, and so that makes me wonder, how do you make the educators passionate? Well, and I, I think it's through different ways people learn. So, you know, like using this project, for example, um, with new first year students at QUT, it's like, okay, this is really interesting, and I'm learning something new, and I'm not just reading about it in, in books. I can actually engage with it. So we market it to our students. It's like Pokemon Go. They can run around <laughs> um, the Kelvin Grove campus. And Collect your experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have all of these different experiences across our campus. So, and, um, and they just do it. You know, there's no resistance. Everyone's out doing it. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your question as well. Uh, any more questions from the audience? One here. Mm, yeah, where's the potential for this AR to head yeah. next in education? Um, I, I certainly think, well, I can only speak for QUT, is that um, I'm using a lot of these um, experiences embedded in the curriculum. So students have either, you know, in, now you have, you know, online lectures, then you might have a face-to-face -face tutorial, but then you might have a digital experience mm. as well, all built into the course. Um, my goal is to actually do myself out of a job, so I'm not needed anymore. <laughs> so I can go back and just research something that's completely obscure that no one worries about. <laughs> you know, the Indigenous content is across everything, mm. and I think that's what we want. So when I can do myself out of a job, I think we're there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks for can, your question. Can I say something about Ooh, the yes, schools, if I could, it. just to back that up? Um, the schools do want to do stuff. Um, in the work that we've done, I think I was, I'm keeping a database, we've had 2,100 schools contact us. Mm. And we're not in any capacity to deal with that. And so we're just, in a sense, cherry picking, picking those schools. Teachers want to do this, and they can, they're trying to look at better ways of not causing burnout. So, um, and that's why this technology works. And, and when they're talking about STEAM, they're just looking at the best tool they can get to actually make that happen and and then of course have that fit over the course of a term. So it's a nice, neat start and finish in that regard. And with heads of schools looking at how they've got to comply to what ACARA says, you, you want to give the teachers something that's like on a silver platter because they're already hard pressed as it is and, the, and, and they don't want you don't want them to be fearful of this knowledge mm. and if we can come with it all nicely scaffolded and packed from local perspectives, then it's going to win. Well, on, the, on that note, Brett, for any educators in the room now, and by that I mean teachers, principals, but even parents and guardians who want to play that educational role uh, in young people's lives, obviously for Curiosity Brisbane, there are site-specific ways of accessing these experiences, but are there non-site specific ways of accessing um, this kind of knowledge, that kind of data, when you were talking about the scans of the tools and the boomerangs, for instance, where would they go to find that? 
Who's ever played World of Warcraft? Who's ever heard of World of Warcraft? Yes? Okay. What if you were to make World of Warcraft for Aboriginal culture? Do you want to see that? I've already done it. <laughs> so what we're trying to think about is how do you build a cultural heritage survival game for First Nations people and then have it for everybody to walk in the footsteps of our ancestors? It's just gamifying it, making it fun. So can people access something like access that specifically already? Just keep in touch. Like, <laughs> how, do, um, how do they keep in touch? Um, just so you know, we're building it as we speak. Mm. And it's just, it's, I don't think it's robust. And Peter knows that we're talking about it. I've done some demonstrations. It looks all right, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Curiosity 2022. That's yeah. when it's going to be launched. Fantastic. There was uh, one question here first, was there? And then one behind. Mm. Uh, two different things. Yeah, as you know, um, it was... So the question is about how that knowledge would be accepted within certain school systems and environments? Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I think um, when, I, when I was doing it, it was like mythical stories and whatnot. When, and the thing was that it, what, what I felt was, because it's a nun thing and it was a religious and Catholic thing, it was like there was a bit of a question about whether you know, what we have in terms of the connection to countries is actually a religion. Hmm. A deeper thing. And, um, and I'm only thinking that now. Back then I was like doing that question as a little boy who's eight, eight and nine. But the thing is that um, it's a way of thinking about the world and a way of thinking about how you engage with people around the world and then, again, that connection. But I think, I think what I was saying there was that it's about how you be good um, and I don't think there's a reason why you can't be good with their own cultural context, mm. um, as opposed to the fact that you've got a... Um, I think the same time as I wrote Wonder's Story, I was told I wasn't at church on Sunday. Which, um, yeah, that's mm. how it used to be. Uh, thanks for your question. There was one just behind you. Can the app be used for uh, language teaching as well, as in like First Nations language teaching? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think it can. And um, we're looking at a babble fish for that type of thing, like a Google Translate type thing. Yeah. And that's not a hard thing. But with the question of language. I know there's so many different languages. Yes. It's hard to, you can't sort of pick one. No, I think you should do them all. I think you've got to do them all. But everybody's making a, an attempt, and there's a lot of word lists, and then and getting those together into statements and sentences and ways to communicate, that's important. So I think the journey of getting the language back is so, so much as important as getting it spoken. Um, and uh, we've got a long way to go on it, and everybody's making an attempt. Um, and I come back to people like the Yungenberg Language Centre and the Gadarjal Group and the, the Miramar Program, if you've heard about it. Language is so important because it gives you that description or the descriptions of your culture, your mob and your relationships. It's all, it's so embedded. So um, that's got to happen. So we just got to give better tools for it. And so, and that's the beauty of technology that can expediate that. And if we get behind it, it'll all work. So everybody's having a go. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that, that, what do you call it, that gun app yet, I don't think. Sorry, I've got to say that. Some people will tell you they have, but I don't think we have. Mm -hmm. But if we keep growing on this, if there's real research in it coming out of the university, if, I'll say this really hard, if the government does invest in this research, which is bloody hard at the moment for all our institutions, if they think it's a priority, if they think First Nation principles as a priority, then it will work. 
and, and therefore groups like Miramar, there can be many more going off into regional clusters and then making that happen, mm. at least in our capital cities and regional towns across the country. And while we're speaking of investment, I mean, we've nearly run out of time, but the thing that we can do now, because it's not even lunchtime, is invest our own time into the AR experience of Maywa. So we've all got homework. We're all either tech nerds or education nerds. We're all nerds in this room. Give us the homework. Just a reminder of how to engage with the Maywa app over the course of curiosity, Brett. Oh, just your phone and your camera. Mm -hmm. and, and, then and how many sites are there again? We've been fortunate to have 16. Mm. So there's 16. But... Yep. So if you go to the Curiosity yep. website, yep. you'll be able to see on the map where those sites are, where Maywa AR can be activated and see different experiences, different locations, different, um, yep. different gatherings every time. If you yep. just walk down the hill here, just straight down this path as you walked up, there's one site for AR, Maywa AR just down there. And, there's some, and, and not just Maywa AR, there's a whole lot of great stuff. Mm. There's some wonderful other AR stuff. So in the midst of the AR that we've done, there's many other stories in there. So please just um, mm. visit, have a walk, and, you know, and it's a good, good stroll. You are in one of the four major sites for Curiosity right now. So one is the Botanic Gardens, another one is the Cultural Precinct, uh, you've got it over at South Bank as well, and within the CBD itself. So over the next 16 days, uh, see, if you see purple, that's us. There's going to be something there to explore. There's going to be lots of Maywa AR to explore as well. Um, and just before you go, we've got to give thanks to the Queensland Government through Tourism and Events Queensland, Brisbane City Council, through the Brisbane Economic Development Agency for their support of Curiosity Brisbane. Uh, thanks also to Curiosity Brisbane's major partner, the Courier Mail, media partner Nine Queensland, and Curious Conversations partner NBN Co, who are providing the support for us to live stream this morning conversation globally, and of course supporting the technology that makes something like Maywa AR possible. A final thank you to our precinct partners, Brisbane City Council, South Bank Parklands, Arts Queensland, State Library of Queensland, in Queensland Museum. And of course, let's reserve our final thanks for a wonderful talent this morning. Peter and Brett, thank you so much. Could you put something in thanking Peter and Brett? Thank you so much for making the time this morning. Stay curious and have a great Curiosity Brisbane. Cheers.